Well, I am glad to be here, and I want to read the scripture first, and, and then I'll get better acquainted. So uh, Donna's already done a better job of that than I, but go to Psalm chapter 139, and out of respect for God's word, I'll invite you to stand as we read the first 18 verses. It says, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsetting, my uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassed my path, my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. There is not a word in my tongue, but lo, Lord, thou knowest it all together. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thine hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost part of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light unto me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. For thou hast formed my reins. Thou hast weaved me together in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance or my frame was not hid from thee when I was made in secret. Thou creatively weaved me into the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my frame, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, when in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they are more in number than the sand when I awake. I am still with thee. Lord Jesus, thank you for the precious word of God. Thank you for the truth found in this passage. And we thank you for this congregation. And together we pray with them that you will help them in the search committee. And I pray that you'll provide this wonderful light here in our community with the right man to lead them in the days ahead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are glad you're in. We're glad to be here. Uh, I uh, am glad my wife is here. Uh, Susan and I have been married for 51 years, almost. And I thank the Lord that she's able to, to travel with me. You know about the three rings of marriage, right? There's the engagement ring. There is the wedding ring. And there is suffering. And... Uh, <laughs> Ronnie Cates told me that one, if you want to know. <laughs> and I'm glad Susan is able to travel with me. We, we, the Lord has given us three wonderful kids and uh, seven, great, seven grandkids. And uh, our first great-grandchild was born in August. And six weeks later, the Lord brought her home. And, uh, so we, but we thank the Lord for our family. And I'm glad my mom is able to be here. My mom and dad are 94 years old. And uh, they've been married 73 years. And uh, my dad is in the uh, memory cherish unit at Arbor Trace. And my mom is in the assisted care. And they're able to see one another. And, and uh, my mom and dad have been in this community and served the Lord. And God has used them. And uh, just like God, I saw... Pastor Hoskins here, Phil, and what a blessing he's been to our community over the years. And, uh, and uh, you know what we need today? We need some more Phil Hoskins and Frank Holmans that'll stand up. And uh, this generation needs that. And, and it was a pleasure to, to see him. And uh, glad to see Donna. We, boy, we grew up together. 
In fact, she kept her brother and I out of trouble a lot of times, and, uh, but it's good to see her. Thank you for the invitation. And I do want to encourage you. The Lord will give you the right man. Uh, I got to spend some time with Pastor Hay. I knew Pastor Spahn. He used to, he and, he used to beat me up and go off. Uh, you know, and, uh, and uh, it's been a privilege to know many of the folks I'm having the, being able to preach to today. Uh, uh, I, there were some folks, I won't give you a name, I don't know the name. I, she, they said, we're glad you're here. And I said, well, I hope you are when I'm done. She said, as long as you preach the Bible, we'll be glad. And I like that. And I am going to preach the Bible. Uh, somebody said to me the other day, you know, for uh, 21 years, I pastored Hillcrest Baptist Church here in the community. Uh, I pastored a church in, up by Toledo for almost 20 years, and then I was in an, in an itinerary type of ministry for seven or eight, and uh, I officially retired in March. Here's where my heart lies in. I would be remiss not to thank this church for this, Brother Jack, but uh, this church has supported Crossroad Recovery Center for Women. And that's where my heart lies. I told the Lord, I said, when I retire, I just want to put my time. I don't work with the women, uh, but uh, God gives me the opportunity to raise support. I was in uh, Indianapolis. I worked for Matt Stiegel. Some I needed something to do and, and some time. And also I like to eat. So uh, I uh, worked for Matt Stiegel and... Uh, uh, he sent me at a conference over in Indianapolis. And I got over there as a conference for undertakers. And uh, I got over there, and this young girl, to me, she's young. Anybody's young, except Jack. And, uh, you know, and she came up to me, and she passed her home, and she threw her arms around my neck. And I thought, oh, my soul, I don't know this girl. And she recognized that, and she stepped back, and she said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, you're going to have to help me. And she gave me her name. She said, seven years ago, she said, I was homeless. And she said, I came to Crossroad. And she said, it was there I found the Lord. And she said, it completely delivered me, the Lord did, from my addictions. I said, what are you doing here? She said, I'm getting my funeral director's degree today. And it's that type of story that your uh, support has helped. And that's where my heart lies. And, and I'm trying to figure out all that now. And, uh, and at the same time, the Lord's let me walk into a pulpit. I've been preaching almost every Sunday except for July and August when the doctor said I had to take a, take a break from that. I had a guy walk up to me. He said, Olman... He said, what are you doing leaving the pulpit and going into the undertaking business? <laughs> well, that wasn't exactly true. I haven't left the pulpit. I looked at him and I said, listen, I said, I spent 50 years in the pulpit trying to straighten guys out like you and you never straightened out. Now as an undertaker, when I straighten guys out like you, you stay straight. <laughs> He hadn't talked to me since. <laughs> well, I want to I wanna share something with you from God's Word. I don't know about you, but I'm glad we got God's Word. I'm glad the Bible doesn't just contain the Word of God. I'm glad it is the Word of God. By the way, if it's not the Word of God, I might as well go out and join the moves. Quit joining churches. Because this is what gives us hope. And I want to offer you something today from... Psalm chapter 139, and I've entitled it this, Things We Take for Granted. Don't we take a lot of things for granted? These first two points have to do with an experience I went through a year ago. But the last point is where I focus in on God's working in our life. You know, it was a year ago in October, on October 7th, that both my wife and I were diagnosed with COVID-19. And I remember standing there thinking to myself, 
this is going to kill her because of her pre-existing condition. It, her symptoms were asymptomatic. But it took me, a guy that didn't even take an aspirin, and honestly, it beat me up like an old drum. The next day on Thursday, I, uh, in the afternoon, I took a coughing spell. It, it was incredible. And uh, my chest felt like it was going to burst wide open. My lungs felt like they were going to fly out of my chest. And then I started spitting up blood, a lot of blood. And uh, I knew then that I probably had an issue, so my daughter took me to the hospital, and they admitted me. Two days later on Saturday, uh, I took another one of those coughing spells. This one lasted an hour and a half, same scenario. Chest felt like it was going to burst wide open. Uh, lungs felt like they were going to fly out of my my body, uh, this time a whole lot of blood. And I don't know the doctor's name. I had never really, I had not seen him before. I know most of them there. But he was walking by my room. He wasn't dressed to come into a COVID patient's room. But he opened the door just a bit and he pointed his finger at me through the door and he said, you're going to ICU. That was on the 10th of October. I don't remember another thing until November 19th, six weeks later. I was in the hospital for 78 days. I was on a ventilator for 39 days. I was on a trait for 29 days. Uh, I developed a, a, uh, a hole in my esophagus. Probably when they when they put the ventilator in, they, they created the hole. But the doctor there told my boy, they, he said, we don't have a surgeon here that can repair this. And your dad is not going to live unless we can get him to a place where they can repair that. So on October the 16th, I was life flighted to Indianapolis, St. Vincent's Hospital. I saw Jeff Kappa, who was, of course, the sheriff of our county for a number of years at the hospital about a month ago. And he walked up to me and he gave me a hug and he said, Pastor Holman, I'm so glad to see you. He said, I was one of the guys that helped put you on the helicopter. Me, Steve Smith, who comes to Hillcrest, and, and Stacy Severance, a nurse who comes to Hillcrest, said the three of us didn't believe that you would make it to Indianapolis. Your oxygen level was under 60. You were bad, bad, in bad shape. And all three of us prayed. He said, in fact, Stacy got down next to you and, and put his lips up against your ear and started praying that God would, would heal you, that God would raise you up. When I got to St. Vincent's, of course, I was in a coma. Uh, this is the story I was told. The surgery room was ready. The surgeon was ready. And he came in once I was in place and he looked at the nurse and he said, told this later to my boy and to my brother, said, we're not sure what's going on. They either diagnosed him, misdiagnosed him at Reed or a power greater than I has already corrected the problem. And I look back and I think God's hand was on that. I can't tell you the number of people that was praying for me. I had a lady a couple of months ago. I was doing a funeral, so I was in a suit. No idea who she was. She turned around and to me and she said, she said, I want you to know I like to see guys in suits. She said, they don't even wear suits to church anymore. I said, where do you go to church? She said, I go to St. Andrews. And I said to her, I said, well, until recently, I pastored Hillcrest Baptist Church. She took a couple steps back. Her mouth flew open. She said, are you Marty? I said, I am. She said, take that mask off. She said, I want to get your picture. My prayer group at St. Andrews has been praying for you. It's the prayers of God's people. And God chose, for whatever reason, to let me live. And uh, 
When I woke up, somebody said, what was the darkest day of the whole experience? Well, the darkest day of the whole experience was when I woke up in rehab. I started to wake up about November 19th. And I started to come out of it. And it was the only day in my, the entire time that they let visitors in. And I woke up and the first person I saw was Sam Weatherby. Some of you know Sam. I thought, oh my soul, I've died and gone to hell. And, <laughs> and then Alan Russell came in and I was convinced that's where I was. Uh, Sam doesn't care if I say that, but I got to be careful about Sandy. She doesn't like that. <laughs> so I never say it when they're around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I woke up in rehab on November the 23rd. I couldn't walk. I couldn't talk. I couldn't breathe on my own. I couldn't swallow. I, I, I mean, I'd lost the ability to do all that. And a great big six foot six African American doctor came in. He was in charge of the rehab. He was over in Indianapolis. And he looked at me and he said, Holman, he said, I see from your chart that you've been active. I see that you never smoked. He said, I see that you play racquetball. He said, that's why you're still alive. Well, I couldn't talk, so I raised my hand and he gave me the whiteboard and I wrote out, Doc, I think God had something to do with that. He said, whatever, you know. <laughs> Later on, he told me he was an atheist. Well, I started praying. There was a lady doctor there that was in charge of the physical therapist who came to me and she said, are you a pastor? I said, I am. She said, would you pray for me? And I stopped her. I said, well, I'm a pastor, but I said, I'm also a Christian. I said, so I'd be glad to pray with you. And about what? She said, I was just diagnosed with renal cancer. And so I started praying with her and her husband. And uh, he, uh, and today, I still pray with him. I prayed with him last Saturday on the phone. Well, this doctor that was an atheist came in. He said, would you pray with me? I was shocked. I said, about what? He said, it's none of your business. <laughs> I said, well, I'll pray with you, doc. But remember this, God doesn't want to be your genie. He wants to be your Lord. And uh, he said to me, he said, well, I've tried everything else. So I started praying with him. Well, he had told me when I walked in there in November, he said, you're not going to get out of here to March. He says, and when you walk out of here, you're going to have to go on either a walker or a wheelchair. Well, I didn't say anything. I didn't have any idea. But I walked out of there on December 23rd without a walker and without a wheelchair. He was so excited, honestly. He was really excited for me. Well, I took advantage of that and I said, Doc, I said, how about doing a Zoom Bible study with me for five weeks? You can pick the day. I said, I want it to be in the afternoon. He said, I don't know. I said, listen, I said, you are brave enough to tell me you're an atheist. Give me five hours. I said, at the end of the time, if you don't like it, fine, no harm done. Well, on the fifth, and the first couple of weeks, his language was atrocious. I think he was doing that as sort of a shock thing. And the guys at the, one of the guys at the funeral home that's a believer said to me, he said, why do you tolerate that? I said, look, I said, it's not my job to change him. That's God's job. It's just my job to share Christ with him. Well, the fifth week, he trusted Christ. Bowed his head and trusted Christ. And he, he and his wife invited us my wife and I, to his home on a Saturday night in uh, June to have dinner with him. They live up in Fishers. My wife fell that week and broke her hip and couldn't go. So I went ahead. We decided I'd go ahead and go. And uh, we, I had dinner with him. And when he left the room, his wife looked at me and she said, what have you done with my husband? <laughs> I said, well, I hope that's good. She said, I'm not married to the same guy. She said, I can't explain it. I said, well, I said, the only way anybody can explain it is through Jesus Christ. Now, she's still not saved, but she'll call and she'll give uh, stuff to Crossroad, believe it or not. 
And I told him, I said, you got her attention, buddy. Don't mess it up. She said, well, how can I mess it up? I said, you can if you just live for Jesus. I said, you'll make mistakes. So I finally got out of the hospital. And, you know, one of the things that happened to me is as I was coming out of my coma, I wasn't completely out of it. And I was sedated. I was in and out. The nurses, and boy, we got some great people in the medical field. I mean, the nurses and the doctors I had at Reed and the nurses and the doctors that I had at St. Vincent's and even in that rehab, they were incredible during that whole time. They had to come in and suit up. They looked like Star Trek people. And, but they were incredible. God used them in, in my life. But this nurse I know thought I was asleep. But she said to another nurse, she said, I don't think he's going to make it to the morning. And I heard what she said and I thought, boy. And as I lay there, I thought, I wonder if I'll ever see my wife again. I wonder if I'll ever see my kids again. Wonder if I'll ever see my grandkids again. Don't you agree we take our family and our friends for granted? I have some wonderful friends. The Girdley family and the Holman family have been friends for 65 years, I suppose. I have some great friends at Hillcrest. I have some great pastor friends. I thought, I wonder if I'm going to see some of them ever again. We take our health for granted, don't we? I was in my, when I was a young preacher back in the mid-70s, I've been pastoring since 75, but I, I uh, went to visit a guy in the hospital, and I, that's in the days when they had more than one person in a room, and I visited the person I was there to see, and as I started walking by the guy in the next bed, he reached out and grabbed my arm, pulled me down, he said, are you a preacher? I said, I am. He said, would you give your church a message for me? I said, well, it depends on what that message is. He said, tell your church that we don't appreciate our health until we lose it. Isn't that true? We take our health for granted. But here's the focus in the time I have left from Psalm chapter 139, we take the fact that God is at work in each one of our lives for granted. And he is every day. Whether we realize it or not, he's at work. And if you take Psalm chapter 139 apart, you see there's 24 verses. Each verse links God the creator with you and I, his creation. The first six verses talk about the fact that God is omniscient. In other words, there's nothing that God does not know. These two ladies said it so well today. God knows everything about us. Verses 7 to 12 talk about the fact that God is omnipresent. There's no place where God is not. And then beginning in verse 13 through verse 18, it talks with us about the fact that God cares. And watch this. Only a God who knows you and only a God who is near you could be so intimately involved in the making of you. Look at verse number one. Verse number one. O Lord, thou hast searched me. And know me. You see that word search? That word search means to examine through and through. To dig into. Here's a great thought for all of us this morning. Do you know that God couldn't know you and me better? You're not just an insignificant speck or an unimportant nobody to the God who created you. Rather, you and I are the object of God's close personal attention. Every moment 
of every day. Look at verse 2. Thou knowest my downsetting and my uprising. Uh, downsetting. Have you ever had a day when you didn't really seem to have a care in all the world? You're sitting down, you got your feet propped up, you got a glass of iced tea next to you. Even in those casual moments of life, God knows you. But then he goes, not only you're downsetting, but you're uprising. Have you ever had those days when 24 hours in a day is not enough to get everything done that you need to get done and it seems like it's just chaos around you? Maybe you've been had bad news about a health issue. Maybe you've had a relationship break up. Maybe something else going on. Maybe you've got a thousand things going on and you're saying, how am I going to get all of this done? Even at that moment, God knows you. And then notice what he says, thou understandest my thought afar off. Every thought we've ever had, God knows about it. Now, don't ask me how. Suppose my friend Jack Doyle had a thought. I know that's highly unlikely, but work with me, would you? So, suppose he had a thought. We might see the thought as it enters his brain because his face lights up. We might see the thought as it exits his brain because we hear him communicate it in his words. But you and I cannot see what happens between the entrance and the exit. But God can. Because God understands every thought that you and I have ever had. He could know you better. He understands all our thoughts. Not only that, look at the next verse. Thou compassed my path and my lying down. That word compasses means that God sifts through. It's the idea, did you ever, did you ever uh, watch someone sift wheat? Did you ever sift wheat yourself? God sifts through all my actions. God sifts through all my attitudes. So not only does God know every thought I've ever had, but God knows the motives behind all my actions. And watch this. And then he says, that's why he can be acquainted with all of our ways. That is pretty incredible. And then he goes on to say, for there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together. This blows my mind. God knows every word of every language, of every human being, on every continent, every moment of every day. I can't even imagine that. God could not know you and me better. He knows our thoughts. He knows our motives. He knows our words. And then look at the next verse. It says, thou hast beset me behind and before. You see that word beset? That word beset means to be hemmed in. Have you ever had those times in your life where your back is up against the wall and you're saying, how in the world did I get into this? And how in the world am I going to get out of it? I can't tell you the number of times people have looked at me and with tears rolling down their face have said to me, Preacher, is this ever going to end? And there are times in your life and mine, for whatever reason, God allows it. And we feel like we're hemmed in. But notice what it says. Even in those places, his hand is upon us. Wow. And notice what he says in the next verse. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. My kids are all in their 40s. When they were teenagers, they would say, Dad, that's cool. Dad, that's awesome. You know what the psalmist is saying right here? God, you couldn't know me better. You understand all my thoughts. 
You understand my motives. You understand every word I've ever said. You're with me in the hard times in life. Heavenly Father, that's awesome. That's cool. I can't believe it. What does these first six verses offer us? It offers us the fact that God is omniscient. There is nothing he does not know. He could not know any of us better. And then we go to verse 7. Verse 7, we find that God is not only omniscient, but he's also omnipresent. There's no place where he's not. Notice what it says. It says, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? Can you imagine running from someone who's everywhere? Joseph found out the, or Jonah found out the hard way. You can't do that. And then in verse number eight, he says, if I ascend up into heaven, thou. You see that word thou in the King James? That word is, it's abrupt. In the Hebrew, it's abrupt. It's emphatic. What he's saying, it, no matter where I go, thou, God, are there. You're there. And then we look at verse nine. If I take the wings of the morning. Boy, today, wasn't today a beautiful day? She got up and the sun made its way over the rim of the world. And you know what I think he's telling us? Boy, this is the speed of light. Do you know that if you traveled at the speed of light, it'd take you four seconds to get to the moon. And when you got there, God would be there because there's no place where God is not. And if you traveled at the speed of light, it would take you four years to get to the nearest star, the Alpha Centauri. And when you got there, God would already be there because there's no place where God is not. Because he's omnipresent. And look at the last part of verse 9. And dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. I've been fishing. Just The first time I ever went fishing was in the Pacific Ocean. I, I, I could, if you like fishing, more power to you. I'm not a fisherman. Put a seven iron in my hand. And, uh, you know, Ronnie Cates has played with me. He'd say, you don't know what to do with that either. And, and uh, but... Uh, I'm not much of a fisherman, but I was preaching in Costa Rica and they took me out to the uh, Pacific Ocean on a fishing vessel and they put a fishing pole in my hand and the farther you go out, the more insignificant you seem. And you know what I think he's telling us here? Even in those insignificant times in our lives, God, are you there? God, are you here? God, can't you help me a little with this? God, I, I feel so alone. Even in those times, those insignificant times in our life, look at verse 10. Even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. And then he goes to verses 11 and 12. And I got to tell you, this, this just takes my breath away when you think about it. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. My dad doesn't go anymore, but beginning in 1986... My two brothers, I have two brothers that are both pastors. My, one, my youngest brother pastors the Landmark Baptist Temple, now the Landmark Church in Cincinnati, Ohio. And my other brother pastors First Baptist Church in, in uh, uh, somewhere south of us. And uh, <laughs> someone's looking at their husband and saying, I knew he's over 70. And uh, <laughs> Brookville, that's the name of the place. Brookville, and we'd go to Michigan every uh, year to play golf for three days. And in the first year, man, it, when they turn the lights off up there in northern Michigan, you can't even see your hand in front of your face. And the very first year that we were there, my youngest brother, Matt, he left the hall light on all night. And I thought, he is afraid of the dark. So the next night, when he went into the bathroom I slipped out into the hallway and I unscrewed the light bulb 
And then I made my way into his bedroom and I hid in the closet. <laughs> and I heard him come out of the bathroom and I heard him feeling along the wall trying to find the light switch and he finally found it and then he went up and down, up and down and it never came on. How could it? I had unscrewed the light bulb. So he shut the light off and he made his way down the hallway. When he got to his room, he turned the light on and he looked around. I was hiding in the closet. He turned the light off, took three steps and landed in bed. I waited about five minutes. And when, after five minutes, I slowly made my way across the carpet on my stomach. And when I hit the bed, my hand went up the bed and across the sheet. And when I hit his leg, business picked up. He let out a scream. And buddy, he took off out of that bed like he was shot out of a cannon. And someone's saying, how childish, how foolish. Yet people will say, I will do this in the dark and no one will ever notice how wrong you are because even the dark is not dark to the Lord. He's omnipresent. There's no place where he is not. Listen, folks, I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what burden you're carrying. God is near and God could not know you better. Notice as we move into verse 13. Verse 13 shows us how much God cares. For thou, again that in the Hebrew, it's abrupt, it's emphatic. For thou and thou alone hast formed my reins. I learned something as Donna was talking today about the fact that God not only created us on the outside, and about the illustration of twins and the fact that their DNAs are different. I, I got to wrap my arms around it, but that's an incredible thought. By the way, you're not here because some stork delivered you to Reed Hospital. You're not here because you're the object of Mother Nature. You're here because God and God alone created you. For thou, you and you alone, hast formed my reigns. That word reigns is an old English word that, that means uh, uh, the insides, the DNA. Never thought of it in that light before. But he's talking about the lungs and the kidneys and, and the liver and the heart. It was God and God alone that formed us. Thou hast covered me in the King James, but actually it means weaved, weaved me together. Like a, like a lady, like uh, Donna's illustration of paint just being splattered. That's not the idea there. It's a lady making a fine tapestry. God, it was you that weaved me together in my mother's womb. Verse 14, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. My substance, that word substance means frame, skeleton, was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, and creatively weaved together. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. Embryologists will tell you that this is the perfect description of an embryo in the womb. And let me make a statement here and do it in kindness and in love because I realize that there are ladies who have made the decision to have an abortion. And I am so very glad that God forgives. I am, I'm so very glad that God's grace doesn't exclude anyone. I'm glad that that poor decision can be overcome by God's wonderful grace. But this verse shows me, and there are other places in scriptures, that life begins at conception. You see what happened? I'm a preacher that's done 1,000 and seven funerals in 50 years. 1,007 times I've walked with some family out yonder to the silent city of the dead. 
In one week, I had the funeral of a lady that was 101 years old. This is just a couple of weeks ago. And the next week, I did the funeral for my six-week-old great-grandbaby. And I can tell you that what I've reminded people is all of us spent nine months in the womb of our mother. A life was being prepared for planet Earth. And then we spend whatever days God gives us, whether that be 101 years or whether that be a few short weeks, a life is being prepared for somewhere in eternity. But I've got to tell you, when we as a nation decide that the spotted owl or the life of a spotted owl is more important than a baby in the womb. We're in trouble as a nation. God's eyes were on you and me in the womb of our mother. And then notice this. And then it says, And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. Boy, even as we walk through life, God's ordained our steps. I can't explain that. I wish I could. If I could explain foreknowledge and predestination and the fact that God knows and is in control of all things, man, I'd probably get rich writing a book or two. I, it's beyond me. But I do thank the Lord for the fact that he's in control of everything. And not only this, watch this. Not only was his eyes on you when you were in the womb of your mother, not only was his eyes on you as you lived out your life, but notice in verse number 17, he says, how, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me. The psalmist said, God, what you said to me is that you know me, you couldn't know me better. You're near me no matter what I go through and you care about me because you're the one responsible for my DNA. Oh God, how great is the sum of them. And then he says, if I should count them, they are more than numbers in the sand. And when I awake. In the Bible, the Bible talks about death as being asleep because the truth of the matter is death doesn't end anything. People are going to spend somewhere forever. And the choice is up to us. But even in death, God's eyes are on us. You don't think God cares about you? You don't think God knows your name? You don't think God loves you? Right here, it's written down how much he cares. He's near us. He knows us. And he cares about us. Many, many, many years ago, I had a friend. He was born with cerebral palsy. He couldn't walk right, couldn't talk right. And uh, one day he came to me, he said, Pastor Holman, this was the first church I pastored, all the way back 1975. He said, Pastor Holman, can I teach a class of kids? I said, Bobby, I love you, but that's not your gift, but I'll let you help out in a class. So he went into this class of boys and Man, did he shower love on them. On Saturday, he'd take them to the park. He'd take them to the Dairy Queen. He'd take them to the library. He'd help them with their homework. I mean, he'd spend the day with these kids. And, and he could do it. He drove at that time. One day, the doctor said, Bobby, you can't drive anymore. Well, he didn't really, wasn't really concerned about that, but he thought, how am I going to take care of my kids? So he tried doing it on a bicycle. There was no way he could go to people's homes and that community on a bicycle. So he came to me and he talked to me about it. I said, Bobby, I said, why don't you call different people in the church and get them to take you to the different places on Saturday? And so he started doing that. For a while it worked pretty good, but it was an all-day deal. He'd leave at 8 o'clock in the morning, wouldn't get home to 5 o'clock, and these people worked all week, some of them, and they didn't want to take up the whole Saturdays. So he had a hard time finding people after a while. So when he couldn't find anybody, he'd call me. I don't know why he'd do this, but he'd call me at 5 o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning. And here's what he'd say. He'd say, Pastor Holman, you don't have anything to do today. Pick me up at 8 o'clock. 
I'd want to reach through that phone and grab a hold of him by the neck, slap him silly. My wife would point her finger at me and say, don't you be mean to him. Oh, I hate people with the gift of mercy. And so I go pick them up some Saturdays that I could and take them around. It was all day deal and on and on. One day I, I decided, I'm going to fix him good. So Friday night I looked at Susan and I said, I hope Bobby calls me today. Have you got saved? No, I hope he calls me. I didn't tell her what I was going to do because I knew better than that. So 5 o'clock the next morning, here's Bobby Hufford. Pastor, you don't have anything to do today. Come pick me up. This time I had a smile on my face. I went and picked him up at 8 o'clock and I took him all around. We made all those visits, did a number of things. Finally at 5 o'clock I said, Bobby, would you make a visit for me, with me? Oh, he liked that. He said, sure, Pastor. So we went out to the edge of town to a place called Millersville, Ohio. And we pulled into a driveway. And when we pulled into the driveway, Bobby said, is this it? I said, this is it. So I got out, took him longer to get out on his side, but he finally got out. When he got out, I got back in and locked both doors. He had no idea what was going on. About this time, a great big St. Bernard dog came around the corner of that house. Bobby Hufford was afraid of dogs. He tried to get back into the car. When he realized he couldn't get back into the car, he didn't quite know what was going on. He started to run. He couldn't outrun that dog. So he grabbed that door handle and he started screaming, Pastor, Pastor, I'm dying, I'm dying. I'm dying. Please unlock the door. And I'm inside the car about to split a gut. I'm laughing so hard. And this great big St. Bernard dog comes and jumps up on him and pins him against the car. That dog didn't have a tooth in his head. And that was the friendliest dog in the world. Just started licking him across the face. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking I'm mean. Let me tell the rest of the story. Several years later, I was back in that community. I was traveling. And I was back in that community, and somebody asked me to go see somebody in the hospital. And so I went into going in the hospital. Out comes Bobby's mother. And she saw me, and she said, Pastor Holman, what are you doing back in this area? I said, I'm just back here for a while. She said, Bobby's up on such and such a floor. He'd love it if you'd stop and see him. So I made my way to that room, and when I walked in, there was Bobby Toombs running in and out of his inflamed body. He saw me, and a great big old smile broke out across his face, and I walked over to his bed, and I reached down, and I gave my friend a great big hug. And we talked, and we laughed, and I read him some scripture. And when I got ready to leave, he said, Pastor, let's sing that song that you and I used to sing in the car. I looked around and I said, Bobby, there's people in this room. Neither one of us, Bobby, can sing and you're worse than I am. He said, let's sing it. I looked down at my friend and we started to sing. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord hath made that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made. When I finished and he finished, the tears were rolling down both our cheeks. And I reached down and I gave my friend a great big old hug, knowing that it would probably be the last time I saw him this side of heaven. A couple of weeks later, his mama called me in my office in Tucson, and she said, Bobby's gone. He died this morning. The world said... No great loss. Just a cripple boy. God said, wait a minute. Wait a minute here. Fearfully and wonderfully made. 
The world said, no great loss. He couldn't walk right. He couldn't talk right. God said, wait a minute. Fearfully and wonderfully made. And you know what God says when he looks at you and when he looks at me? Fearfully and wonderfully made. And as the psalmist recognized that, notice what he said in verse number 23. As we close this morning, he said, search me, O God. God, you couldn't know me better. Search me. Continue your work in my life. And as you're doing it, uh, know my heart and try me and know my thoughts and take your flashlight of righteousness and point it in areas of my life that need attention. Can I tell you something with all the kindness I have in my heart? And as this finger points this way, it needs to point back here. Some of us that have been saved so long we pride ourselves on the fact, you know, look at what I am on the outside when God wants us to look on the inside. Because real spirituality is not come from the gifts of the Spirit. Real spirituality comes from the fruit of the Spirit, which is love and joy and peace and long-suffering. Would you bow your heads with me as I invite the people that are going to close the program to come. Take thought to what the psalmist said. The psalmist said, God, you know me. You're near me. You care about me. I didn't deal with the last few verses because of time. It's the fact that God watches over us. He protects us. And realizing that, the psalmist said, Lord, take that flashlight that you have and shine it on areas of my life that need attention. Let me ask you today, what areas in your life need some attention, need some work? May God point them out to you and me this very day.